In fifth place, we have Diamond Proof of an SA Scandal. Alrighty, can I get a show of hands? What's the first thing you think of when I say priest and scandal in the same sentence? Do those two words have the initials SA? I had a feeling. So those are words that this platform doesn't really like, so pardon me while I try to dodge them, and I apologize in advance for how comical I'm about to sound. This affair kicks off on June 22nd of 2023, when the Society of Jesus of Bolivia acknowledged that it had received from the Vatican a copy of the diary belonging to the late Alfonso Pedrejas, who was a priest accused of taking advantage of dozens of minors. He died of cancer in 2009, so he never faced repercussions for his actions in his lifetime. Primarily known as Father Pica, he was placed in boarding schools for impoverished youth, primarily in Cochabamba in the 1970s. So the diary was turned over to the prosecutors in that same city for that reason, and it was discovered that the late priest kept detailed accounts of the underage horrors he committed in Bolivia. So at one point, according to his diary, he told a colleague about the crimes, only to be advised not to mention it in future confessions. Ah, uh, yeah. The good old ignore it and it'll go away approach. The priest's nephew, Fernando Pandreas, discovered a printout of the diary in an attic and turned it over to a major newspaper. And in its pages, the priest wrote lines such as, I hurt so many people. Too many. The newspaper publishing excerpts from the diary prompted an outcry in Bolivia and an official Vatican response. Go figure. Pope Francis promised to ensure the full cooperation of the church to work alongside the government as it investigates the allegations. He also expressed sorrow over the ongoing revelations in the Catholic Church, calling them deplorable. Yeah, okay. And remind me again, what does uh, full cooperation mean? Coming from an institution that covers up more than it discloses, pardon me if I take that with um, a pound of salt. Bolivian President Luis Arce has called on his country to strengthen controls to prevent foreign priests with, you know, a history of sexual crimes from entering the country. Which, you know, it's fine, and obviously I support that, and, you know, great. But it's hard to find that out when the church is super skilled at covering things like that up. Priest Jordi Bortomio, a sex crime investigator from the Vatican, arrived in Bolivia back in May to gather information about prevention efforts being undertaken within the church to stop these kinds of crimes. Well, that sums it up right there for me, folks. The church has its own sex crime investigator. It's such a problem that they have a specialist. And before someone feels like fighting me on this, specialty jobs like that only exist because there's a need and a problem. That's not the kind of job that just got created out of midair for kicks. The investigation into Pendrejas joins at least 12 other ongoing judicial probes into allegations of clergy sex crimes in Bolivia. So the Bolivian Episcopal Conference has said, you know, one priest has already received a 10-year sentence for his crimes, while another priest, Milton Murillo, was sent to pretrial detention for three months in May. New testimony against Murillo emerged in the wake of the Pendreja scandal as prosecutors called on survivors to step forward. Okie dokie. Time to move on before I start hissing like a tea kettle, and I swear by the end of today, I'm going to turn into a caricature with like a storm cloud over my head. In fourth place, we have a drastic loss of support. So in Germany, people who are formerly members of a church pay a so-called church tax that helps to finance it in addition to the regular taxes that the rest of the population have to pay. If they register their departure though with local authorities, they don't have to pay it anymore. Granted, there are some exceptions for like low earners, folks who are jobless, retirees, students, and etc. But I'm pretty sure here in North America, all money given is through donation, and you just, you know, stop going on your own terms if you want, but it's more complicated elsewhere. But also feel free to let me know in the comments if I'm wrong, because I'm not a certain expert on Catholicism. Anywho, more than half a million people formally left the Catholic Church in Germany last year, which was significantly higher than the previous record. The German Bishops' Conference said specifically that over 522,000 people left the church last year, which is up from around 350,000 in 2021. In comparison, only 1,447 people joined the Catholic Church, which was around the same as the previous year. The departures left the number of Catholic Church members in Germany at nearly 21 million, which is just under a quarter of the population. Now, the Bishops' Conference didn't detail reasons for departures in this annual release of statistics. But many people have turned their backs on the church in recent years, you know, amid follow from scandal over bad things done by clergy and others. Wow, I'm shocked. In 2018, a church commissioned report concluded that at least 3,667 people were harmed by clergy in Germany between 1946 and 2014, with more than half the victims being uh, under 13 and nearly a third of that served as altar boys. Various dioceses tasked law firms or others to put together reports on their own past handling of these cases which has led to massive tensions in the Cologne Archdiocese, where the Archbishop, Cardinal Rainer Maria Wolkai, drew widespread criticism for his handling of a report he commissioned. His offer of resignation has been pending with the Pope for months. Now, an independent report in the Munich Archdiocese, where the late Pope Benedict served as Archbishop from 1997 to 1982, last year faulted the handling of cases by a string of church officials past and present, including the then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger himself. The head of the Central Committee of German Catholics, an influential organization, said she was sad 
but not surprised at the number of departures last year, and has uh, called for reforms and more thorough investigations. Yeah. Good luck with that one. I ain't holding my breath. In third place, we have the Vatican Bank. So formerly known as the Institute for the Works of Religion, the Institute, or the IOR for short, it was founded in June of 1942 by papal decree of Pope Pius XII. So uh, anyone want to guess when they presented their first public operations report? Come on, give it a try. Nope, not anywhere in the 1900s. 2013. Yep, that's what I said. 70 years later, they produced their first, uh, annual report. You know, the thing that's supposed to be held every year. Previous to all this, all internal ledgers were destroyed every 10 years in accordance with their policy. So the IOR's rule is to safeguard and administer property intended for works of religion or charity. And the bank accepts deposits only from top church officials and entities, and is run by a president, but overseen by five cardinals who report directly to the Vatican and the Vatican Secretary of State. So they only report to themselves. For reference, all banks that operate here in Canada have to report to the Minister of Finance. Just saying. Former bank president Atore Tateshi and the Vatican Bank have been investigated on two separate occasions for money laundering. In March of 2012, JP Morgan Chase closed a Vatican account in Milan after the IOR was unable to respond to questionable money transfers. In 2010, Italian authorities seized 30 million from a Vatican account at Italy's Credito Artigano Spa, following allegations that the IOR violated anti money laundering laws. Now, Everybody denied wrongdoing, and no charges were ever filed. The money was released after the IOR promised to pass measures to come into full compliance with international standards on money laundering and terrorism financing. In September 2019, German Cardinal Reinhard Marx, who was in charge of the Vatican's Economic Council, confirmed that Pope Francis had instructed him to reduce costs in an effort to eliminate a deficit that is estimated to be around 70 million euros. Don't get excited though, that's not a concrete number from them because, you know, that would be way too transparent. The exact amount is up for debate because the Vatican had not published a budget since 2015 and has been without an in-house auditor for two years or more. And uh, pardon me while I'm gonna blink real slowly here. The Vatican enjoys a property tax break for all non-commercial properties containing a chapel. So using this loophole, between the years 2006 to 2011, the Vatican evaded taxes that amounted to 4 billion euros. The European Court of Justice ruled this illegal and the Vatican had to cough up those uh, euros as tax because, you know, every kind of organization has that money lying around. And no, the Vatican did not entirely pay for evading taxes. It is argued that if you take into account the taxes that they evaded dating back to, let's say 1992, they would owe over 13 billion euros. Yeah, I'm moving on before my eye twitch gets worse. In second place, we have the Chronovisor. No, this isn't some weird, you know, hat or goggles. Italian Benedictine monk Pellegrino Ernetti claimed to have used a time viewer which could film the past without sound and used it to obtain a photograph of the crucifixion of Jesus and view scenes from ancient Rome, including a performance of a very lost play. Now, this was mostly scrubbed away in history until like 2002 when author Father Francois Bru swore in his book, Le Nouveau Mystère du Vatican, that the chronovisor not only exists, but he learned about it in the early 1960s, a day after he met scientist priest Father Pellegrino for the first time, the two were sailing along the Grand Canal of Venice discussing biblical interpretations when uh, the father explained that theories and interpretations were unnecessary when one could see the truth for himself. So he explained to our lovely author how the chronovisor functioned, allowing the viewer to both see and hear events of the past and future. And hey! If you don't believe my word, his full account is in that book I mentioned earlier. So with a little digging, researchers will find first mentions of the chronovisor in a 1972 article published in the Italian magazine La Domenica del Corriere entitled, A Machine That Photographs the Past Has Finally Been Invented. Belongs to the Vatican, and this chronovisor time machine is heralded as one of the papacy's best kept secrets. It's said to be replete with three precious alloys, cathodes, dials, levers, and has the ability to display myriad historic events in biblical and Roman history. So appear Apparently, since it acts as some sort of television, it can verify all of this. Now, this time machine is claimed to have been invented in the 1950s by a dedicated and secret team of Italian scientists, including who I've already mentioned. Mr. Pellegrino himself. Critics may take credibility issues with the fact that he, you know, eventually became a priest, but he was a scientist first. See, this critic doesn't take issue with that, more so that the Vatican is hiding a tool that could be used to help solve, you know, unanswered crimes around the world and maybe help people. Like imagine how many killings could be solved and how many families of lost people could have answers. Stop being selfish. In first place, we have the allegations from Arise Church. So an external review of Arise Church has called for its entire board to resign after reports from more than 500 current and former members, you know, that include allegations of 
cult-like behavior, racism, essay, and conversion therapy came to light. So that report, compiled by a group called Pathfinding, which is you know a consultancy firm for charitable organizations, was leaked to journalist David Ferrier, who revealed pretty damning allegations. The report was filled with experiences of, like I said, so many people involved with the church, which received nearly 50 million in donations the year before it was released. A 34-page summary of the investigation concluded it was undeniable that there had been significant hurts caused to people involved with a rise in egregious and systemic failures in governance over many years. And, uh, yeah, call for the board members to get the heck out. Arise Church senior pastor John Cameron did resign from his role following all these allegations, and Brent Cameron, pastor and brother of John, also resigned from his position around the same time. In a statement on its website, Arise said it was committed to safely share the stories of those who had participated and the report had been illegally obtained. Sure, whatever you say. The Pathfinding Report recommended a full independent review of the church's finances, including, you know, how donations tagged for certain purposes are used in reality, and a review of policies around expenditure limits for senior leadership. It also recommended disallowing tithing by younglings. And for those who are unaware, it means giving a percentage of your earnings. There was pressure to donate money, and some felt pretty uncomfortable about comments made about their donations. And oh no, ah. Uh, I wish I could swear right now. Underage people should not have to give a percentage of their earnings to anything if they're working. In total, 545 people completed submissions for the review, including folks from every campus across the country, past and present ministry school students, current and former members, staff, and past board members. They revealed harmful practices that had continued up until present day, and a very significant number of people had experiences that caused pain and hurt. A review found racist remarks were said from those preaching on the stage, with some staff being told to focus on white kids. When troubling behavior was experienced by members, they felt unable to speak up due to the pressure to say yes and please senior leaders amid an honor culture that had a strong focus on leadership rather than Jesus. This culture created favoritism among members, and uh, leaders sometimes used derogatory nicknames over a period of months for some individuals. So the reviewers heard from people who were pressured to continue working despite illness or serious injuries, including broken bones and concussions, and the dangers people faced driving through the night on no sleep to meet expectations, and operating heavy machinery after 17 hours of duty. Reviewers heard reports of people at the church who were part of the LGBTQI plus community being subjected to conversion therapy and denied opportunities to serve because of their sin. And when I tell y'all I almost burst into tears when I first read that, as an openly bisexual woman, in today's day and age, I just want to scream whenever someone claims sexuality other than heteronormativity is an abomination or a choice that could be changed. People are born this way and that's their lives. Let them be. It's not gonna hurt your existence. Arise Church has reported a loss of almost 2.8 million and after all of the above came out last year, I could be happier. The average number of people at physical Sunday services fell from 4,000 people to under 3,000, and virtual services were attended by an average of 700 people, down from over 1,000. Numbers also fell across the church's programs for children, which went down, you know, 28%, and uh, young people, which was down 62%. Good riddance. Number five, a time machine. Among the many conspiracies about what goods are hidden inside the Vatican's secret archives, one of the more popular and reoccurring ones is that the Vatican has access to wondrous technology hidden away from the rest of the world, from ancient civilizations, stuff like that. One leading theory is that among these devices is something called the chronovisor, an alleged time machine of sorts that allows the user to peer inside and see whatever time period in history or forwards they desire, like a little time camera. Doctor Who would love it. One Italian monk, one Pellegrino Ernetti, claimed that he developed the chronovisor at some point during the 1950s with a team of 12 esteemed scientists who all wish to remain anonymous in the process. I would put my name on that if I invented time travel, personally. I'd want people to know. The chronovisor is described as consisting of antennas and uh, an unknown metal that's really good at looking through time, a little knob for tuning to a particular time and place, and a screen and recording device. Ernetti described that he and his team used this machine to view speeches by Mussolini and Napoleon, scenes from ancient Rome, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, which they allegedly tried to take a photo of. Now, obviously, no one's seen the chronovisor. If such a device was to exist, it would naturally be pretty secretive. An Italian magazine in the 1970s claims that they found that image of Christ's crucifixion, the photo that was taken through time, only to discover that it was actually just a postcard. So, this one's a bit 
up in the air. Let me know if you think this is real, but also, you know what, let me know what time period you would want to take a picture of, if you could see that up close. And if you're looking for way more scary content, my friends, my friends, you already know Top 5 Scary is the place to be. We've got everything scary under the sun, cryptids, conspiracies, true crime, fake crime, aliens, UFOs, just about anything freaky you can think of. So click on through, subscribe, stay scared, and don't miss a single thing. But keep watching this video too, okay? We worked hard on it. Number four, the three secrets of Fatima. Over a hundred years ago, three young people in Portugal from the town of Fatima claimed that they were visited by the Virgin Mary herself in a vision and the Madonna shared with them wondrous prophecies and visions onto them. These visions, allegedly, were the Second World War, the rise and fall of communism, and the death of a pope. And these were referred to as the three secrets of Fatima. Very cool prophecy stuff. Now, Story goes that the Madonna would visit these three shepherds every six months on the 13th day of each month on the dot. She was very punctual. Influenza would end up claiming the lives of two of these prophets, leaving only one to share messages with the world, and then only briefly too. Conspiracies and conspiracists state that the things the Virgin Mary told the shepherds weren't quite reported on accurately, and in truth, the church knows the real secrets that were bestowed upon the Fatimans, and that these were way too dangerous to be let out, and had to be suppressed and controlled for fear of civil unrest, possibly pertaining to things that could damage the church's good reputation, or change the nature of society as a whole. Maybe the answer as to whether or not that dress was white and black or gold and blue the whole time. An alternate conspiracy is that there were more secrets that the church knows about but refuses to share. Maybe four secrets of Fatima. That makes sense. They're called the secrets of Fatima, not the tell everybody's of Fatima. You want my theory? My conspiracy? Virgin Mary told those shepherds of Fatima the recipe for KFC and Coke and the Vatican realized quickly that information is just too sensitive. That's gotta stay under wraps. Number three, proof of aliens. Well, we already talked a little bit about some of the credible technology that could be inside this archive. And it's thought that the Vatican has all sorts of incredible information hidden away in its vaults that humanity we're just not ready to know about. We're not grown up enough. One of the other leading ones is that theorists speculate that inside those secret, secret archives is indisputable hard evidence of extraterrestrial life. That they're harboring alien skulls and remnants of amazing technology, I guess on borrow from Area 51's collection it's traveling. So the story goes that in the late 1960s, during renovations of the Vatican's archives, excavators uncovered alien skulls beneath the Vatican archives, and somewhere the predator is so upset that he lost those. Is it possible that they worried that if proof of extraterrestrial life got out into the wild, it would discredit belief? Yeah, out there. It wouldn't be the first time, you know, Galileo was famously locked up for his wild beliefs about the celestial bodies that would turn out to be fairly true. So would aliens be any different, really a different story? A Russian engineer named Genrik Marvikic Ludwig was an esteemed scholar who in the 1920s was invited to the secret archives to study. A very prestigious position offered to like less than a thousand scholars a year. According to him, while there, he uncovered documentations that discussed the influence of aliens on civilizations like the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Mesopotamians. Ludwig found records of use of atomic weaponry predating the Manhattan Project, suggesting that this hyper-advanced technology had been in use for years and humanity's leaps and progress were all reverse engineered from our visitors. Maybe the pyramids really were aliens. <laughs> Would certainly be something if that ever came out. I hope in our lifetime, you know, I hope we get to see some aliens and I hope we get to see an alien elected pope someday personally. Number two, proof Jesus never existed or did. Now among the things that you would think the Vatican would really want to keep hidden and on the DL would be proof that the Lord and Savior did not exist. This is another popular conspiracy theory emanating about the Vatican that one of the things they're trying to cover up is some alleged document that insists Jesus as we know him wasn't quite real or wasn't as reported accurately. That would make sense. If I was the Pope, that would be like the number one thing I would want to keep under wraps, right? That would probably destroy the church overnight if that ever came out. Now on the inverse of this theory is a similar theory, totally different direction though, stating that the Vatican secret archives contains indisputable proof that Jesus did exist, 
including correspondences between St. Paul and Emperor Nero, history's favorite bad boy, contemporary paintings and depictions of the man, which would be pretty groundbreaking. You'd wonder though, if they, if they have that, why would they keep that secret? You know, I would, I would leak that one. Now, if you believe this conspiracy and you can carry on with it, it does get a little wild. One author, one Michael Bagnet, claims that the correspondences inside the archives, they proved Jesus did exist, but here's a crazy twist. He didn't die on the cross, as you know, we all know, but rather there was a very complicated scheme with Pontius Pilate to secretly fake Jesus' death to appease the citizens of Rome. Sounds a little bit more like the plot line to a Dan Brown novel. It's a little fantastical, and if true, would probably be the greatest conspiracy theory in, in human history and maybe humanity's most tightly guarded secrets if there's any weight to it. So definitely, you know, if they knew that, they would probably keep that under wraps, keep that in a drawer, <laughs> locked up tight, not let anybody see that. And number one, the Illuminati. Maybe this is one of the most widespread conspiratorial beliefs, maybe one of the oldest conspiracy theories out there, really is that the Illuminati, the centuries old secret society that once started in Bavaria, would eventually grow into an organization capable of challenging the church and overtaking it. And if you believe the conspiracies, it's clandestinely pulling the strings behind everything, controlling the world from the shadows, inserting key members of its order into the highest levels of government, religion, the Disney Corporation, the rap industry, and also including their symbols hidden in everything. That one, I guess, just for like fun, <laughs> just to, I don't know, flex. May I just say though, if the Illuminati are real and, and controlling things, they have got to be the least kept secret order like imaginable since, you know, I'm talking about them. <laughs> Well, the conspiracy goes that the Vatican is closely, closely tied with the Illuminati, with some believing that cardinals and the papacy are all tied to Illuminati interests, and that the secret archives contain bountiful proof of this, memos, meetings, plans for world domination, etc. The Vatican's archives date back centuries, nearly a thousand years worth of old papers, with some documents containing secrets of the Knights Templar, who are thought to be the originators of Freemasonry, the group that would become tied with the Illuminati, that's who the Illuminati was based on. Surely some of those Knight Templar meeting minutes would be particularly illuminating, if you'll pardon that absolutely horrible pun. Of all the ones on this list, I think this one is the most outright likely, since we know the Illuminati did stem from the Freemasons, and we know that there was a real Illuminati, that's an indisputable fact, and we know the Knights Templar, we know all of these groups did exist, and it's very likely that there are some secrets inside the Vatican's archive containing references to those three groups that could fuel the plot lines for the next 12 years of Assassin's Creed games. We got some good conspiracy stuff in there. Number five, Benito Mussolini. The Vatican isn't just the seat of the Catholic Church. Did you know? that actually the Vatican is the smallest country in the world. Despite the fact that it does exist inside Rome, inside Italy, the Vatican technically is not part of Italy, but rather its own sovereign little country. About a thousand people live there total, but it hasn't always been this way. And the reason that it became that way is a little darker than I'm sure the church would like to admit. It was a treaty with fascist leader Benito Mussolini. In 1922, Mussolini and the National Fascist Party came to power in Italy, crushing democracy and putting up a pretty hostile dictatorship in its place. In 1929, Mussolini and the church came together to have a little meet and greet and sign a treaty, granting the church status as a private enclave, a sovereign state inside of Italy. Mussolini wouldn't bother the Vatican, and they wouldn't bother him. Mussolini even paid out a massive, massive settlement which the church invested and is believed to be valued at around $780 million. US dollars, alongside tax exemption and priests getting a nice salary from the Italian government. All of those benefits you can thank a fascist government for. Perhaps most illuminating, however, was a clause that protected the Vatican's dignity, meaning as part of their laws as a sovereign state, they were allowed to arrest and try anyone who criticized the people and the church. In exchange for signing this treaty, the Catholic Church publicly supported the fascist dictatorship and was recognized as Italy's official government. The Vatican's own newspaper printed shortly after the deal went down, Italy has been given back to God and God to Italy. And they only have the support of someone who is involved in hundreds of thousands of deaths to thank. And if you're looking for way more strange true things out of history, conspiracies about the Catholic Church, 
research, cryptids, aliens, and all sorts of freaky business. Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. So click on through, hit subscribe, please make sure to hit that bell so you get everything and do not miss a single screen. But you do that at the end of this video, okay? We got way more Catholic Church secrets coming up. Number 4. The Treacherous Pope Boniface Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. This idea being that none of us are truly free of sin and we're all born into this world natural sinners. Well, some people really take that idea and really run with it. And you would be surprised how high up the Catholic Church some of these troublemakers get. That's where Pope Boniface VII comes in, one of history's most notorious popes for his incredibly unholy behavior. Pope Boniface was actually so wildly controversial that Dante Alighieri wrote in The Inferno that Pope Boniface was condemned to the eighth circle of hell where the frauds were kept. It's a really good window into the sort of general mindset of the population that in their books they were imagining all the ways he'd be tormented in hell. And as a quick aside, for the comment section, Dante's Inferno, is that history's first fan fiction? There's a very serious argument to be made that it is. Anyway, Boniface saw the destruction of Palestrina, a city that had already peacefully surrendered and submitted, but that wasn't good enough for the church. Palestrina had already been burned to the ground, and goofy old Pope Boniface ordered that they plow it down to the dirt and soil to ensure that absolutely nothing of the city remained standing, a real salt of the earth approach. He was definitely a guy who loved his neighbors. He really loved his neighbors, in the sense that the, the vow of celibacy that men of the cloth have to swear to, Boniface didn't really like believe in at all. He was alleged to engage in all kinds of parties with all manner of bedroom companions, having once stated that he felt intercourse with younger people was as natural as hands rubbing together. A really, really great guy all together, and he also loved building statues of himself all the time, so he was very prideful, which that, that's the worst sin of them all. Really. Number 3. Galileo Science and religion do have a place alongside one another in the world, I think. Now, science and religion have had a complicated history, you know, they've never quite seen eye to eye, kind of always furrowing their brows and glaring at each other through the hallways, but one could never truly disprove wholly the existence of God through science, and I think science can illuminate and, and shine new light on, on ways to glorify religion, right? Maybe? Well, not particularly. As one could imagine, there's a great deal of difficulty the church has with science. In 1633, Galileo Galilei, the renowned astronomer, made himself an enemy of the Catholic Church and God for having the unbelievable, blasphemous, heretical viewpoint that the Earth orbits the Sun and not the other way around. Now, Galileo didn't quite have it all the way, since he did posit that the Sun is the center of the universe, and he wasn't super right about that, but hey, Give the guy a little credit. He was doing all this before the TI-84, okay? He was just looking up in the sky making all these guesses. Pretty smart guy. He was doing better than most astronomers out there. Now for this most heinous, disgusting, unbelievably sinful crime, Galileo was arrested and put on trial where ten cardinals sat before him passing judgment and trying to decide how best to punish this disgusting heretic, floating some fun ideas like imprisonment for life, torment being burned at the stake. Again, this is all because Galileo suggested how the planets work, and he was mostly right about this, which is important to hammer home. Eventually, Galileo renounced his beliefs, saying he was wrong and he was getting up there in age and didn't want to spend the rest of his life suffering. So in an act of true humble forgiveness, the church instead decreed that instead of being burned or anything, Galileo be condemned to spend the rest of his days in his home, which he did until his passing. That'll teach him. Now eventually, obviously, the church kind of had to walk back some of that treatment of Galileo. In 1992, they spoke out saying that maybe he was kind of technically right about like a few things here and there and mumbled out an apology like a schoolyard bully being forced to say sorry by the teachers. Sure, it was about 350 years too late, but I bet Galileo probably really appreciated it and would have loved to have known how vindicated by history he would have been. Number 2. The Wild and Wacky Life of Pope Benedict the Ninth. Over the years, there have been many, many controversial popes. I mean, there's a bunch on this list already. In fact, you'd probably find more popes are wrapped in controversy than you might imagine. Now, it's pointless to compare sins on any sort of moral scale as to who's the most evil or, or the worst pope, but it's hard to argue that few of them got up to as much chaos and trouble as Pope Benedict IX, who was one of the wackiest, most notorious popes out there. He once sold the position because he got bored of it. It's said he began his pontification when he was a young, young man 
because his wealthy family just wanted it. And that was like a thing you could do back then. If you had enough money, you could just bribe the church and ask that your son become Pope. Benedict loved the lifestyle and behaved the way Joffrey Baratheon would, you know, kind of really letting the power get to his head almost immediately. He would spend his money on women of the night, hosting lecherous, wild, erotic parties, which allegedly would have all manner of man, woman, and if the stories are to be believed, animals as well. It was not long before there were conspiracies being drawn up to assassinate the Pope, if you can believe that. Even just saying that feels weird, but they wanted to assassinate the Pope. Probably in a case of divine intervention or, or fate, on a feast day, his enemies snuck into St. Peter's Basilica carrying rope, ready to tangle up the Pope. But a solar eclipse scared the assassins so badly they called the whole thing off, and to be honest, I totally get it. If I was planning on disposing the Pope and the sun got blocked out, I'd assume God was furious at me. Failed coups notwithstanding, Pope Benedict's reputation did not improve much. He was attacked by an angry mob in 1045, and he was forced to flee and would be replaced by another Pope, one Sylvester III. Two months later, however, Benedict would return to take the title back. But two months later, he decided that he didn't really enjoy being Pope anymore. It wasn't as fun, what with all the constant bombardment of hate and failed attempts on his life. So he sold it to his godfather for what amounted to nearly $30 million. Imagine buying the Pope. Imagine buying being the voice of God. Anyway, if you can believe it, like Emperor Palpatine, somehow Pope Benedict returned a third time. King Henry III of Germany had arrested Pope Sylvester III for being a false pope, and the godfather that he had sold the throne to had given up the papacy, admitting that it was shameful and heretical for him to have ever done so in the first place. So Henry appointed a new German pope while Benedict was in hiding, and that pope mysteriously passed away eight months later from a poisoning which many historians suspect Benedict had his little fingers in. So Benedict came back for a third time to be the Pope, only this time no one was putting up with him. They'd been through this two more times, they weren't doing it again. Henry III sent troops to drag him out of the Basilica. He spent his dying years in a monastery and is now remembered in history as one of the worst popes ever. And number one, the Pazzi Conspiracy. If you've garnered anything from this video that I've been telling you, I sincerely hope it's that the Pope doesn't always follow the rules. Sure, the guy interprets the will of God, you know, he's got a direct line to talking to him, but that doesn't mean he follows every single one of his rules. Now, we've already discussed some of the wildest sins that Popes have been caught up in, but let's top it all off with a full-blown assassination conspiracy revolving around the Pope ordering a hitman. No, really. In the 1470s, Pope Sixtus IV hatched a scheme to rid Florence of the Medicis, the most influential family in the country at the time rivaling the church. The Medicis had served as the bankers for the papacy for generations and as such were loaded. Pope Sixtus kickstarted this conflict when he changed the Medicis over as the bankers to the Pazzi family who were more loyal to him. The Medicis didn't want to pay to help the Pope claim the town of Imola which the Medicis themselves wanted to lord over. So with these in the way the Pope thought that something had to be done about these meddling Medicis. So Sixtus contracted two assassins to carry out the plot against Lorenzo and Giuliano de' Medici during Easter Mass on Sunday, which just feels unbelievably disrespectful if you're the Pope, you know? You can't talk in church, but you can orchestrate a political assassination. That's fine to do on Sunday, on Easter Sunday. Now, if you're sitting here listening to this and you're kind of scratching your head because you feel like all of this sounds a bit familiar, imagine you have a white hood on and you're jumping into a bale of hay because this was a driving plotline in Assassin's Creed 2 where protagonist Ezio ends up helping out Lorenzo Medici a great deal. Yeah, now the games were really inspired by true history, you know, save for a few extendo blades and boss fights against the Pope. But a lot of that stuff really did happen. History is just as weird as the video games make it out to be. Now, if you remember from Assassin's Creed 2, Giuliano was fatally slain, but Lorenzo survived and rallied support of Florence in a war against the church. Lorenzo picked off conspirators and then sailed to Naples to meet King Ferdinand to discuss a peaceful solution to the bubbling war. There's a reason they called him Il Magnifico. This guy was great at strategy. In the end, the plot failed drastically because all it really did was cement people's support to Lorenzo Medici. People loved the fact that he survived an assassination. They made a medal commemorating this for him, and it brought shame to Pope Sixtus, and it inspired one of the best games Ubisoft ever put out. In fourth place, we have Conscience Court. Yep, 
the Vatican has a secret court for sins based on conscience. Not proof, not evidence, but absolution from conscience. Bishops who handle such hearings are the Apostolic Penitentiary, also known as the Tribunal of Conscience. Created by Pope Alexander in 1179, it was a secret to the public until 2009. Wow, a secret they kept from the general public? Consider me less than surprised. The sins judged in this court vary from spitting out the desecration of a communion wafer to priests breaking their vows of celibacy. Spitting out communion's a sin? News to me. I can think of a lot of icky priests that should go to real court for how they broke their vows, not a court where they're simply forgiven. Sinners who seek absolution have to write a petition to the Holy See. They use pseudonyms to protect their identities and submit the petition to the tribunal. The tribunal considers the matter, but the decision making lies with the major penitentiary. And if he is uncertain, then he submits the matter to the Pope. Until about the 18th century, heinous crimes such as ending lives and fornication against will were judged by the tribunal. Sure, let's give Father whatever his name is a slap on the wrist so he can have a clear conscience about breaking serious laws and go back to his biggest concern about having a perfect life after passing. Because that's the priority for serious crimes. Name with using a fake name for protection. Really great. In third place, time to talk about exorcisms. While I'm sure someone out there is chuckling, exorcisms are nothing to be taken lightly. They're a religious or a spiritual practice of evicting demons, jinns, or other malevolent spiritual entities from a person or an area that is believed to be possessed. It varies a bit from religion to religion, so bear with me while I specify how it works in the Catholic Church. In Catholicism, exorcisms are performed in the name of Jesus Christ. There's a distinction between major exorcisms and minor exorcisms. Minor exorcisms are included in some blessings in which priests create sacramentals such as blessed salt. A related practice is deliverance ministry. Now the distinction between deliverance ministry and exorcism is that exorcism is conducted by priests who are given special permission from the Catholic Church. While deliverance ministry is prayer for people people who are distressed and wish to heal emotional wounds, including those purposely caused by evil spirits. The Catholic rite for a formal exorcism, called a major exorcism, is given in section 11 of Ritual Romanum. The ritual lists guidelines for conducting an exorcism and for determining when a formal exorcism is required. Priests are instructed to carefully determine that the nature of the condition is not actually a psychological or physical illness before proceeding. Sure, I'd love to see their criteria. In Catholic practice, the person performing the exorcism, known as an exorcist, must be an ordained priest. The exorcist recites prayers according to the rubrics of the rite and makes use of religious materials such as icons, sacramentals, and holy relic. The exorcist revokes God, specifically the name of Jesus Christ, as well as saints of the church triumphant and the archangel Michael to intervene with the exorcism. According to Catholic understanding, several weekly exorcisms over many years are sometimes required to expel a deeply entrenched demon. St. Michael's prayer against Satan and the rebellious angels, attributed to Pope Leo, is considered the strongest prayer of the Catholic Church against cases of diabolical possession. The Holy Rosary also has an exorcistic and intercessory power. Cool, maybe I'll go get my rosary one of these days. Holy water is a common aid for exorcism. Its use belongs to the prayer to St. Michael. The chief exorcist of the Vatican, Father Gabriel Amorth, stated that he had performed tens of thousands of exorcisms over his 60 plus years as a priest. Oh my gosh. Additionally, popes have performed exorcisms. Father Amorth states that in 2009, Pope Benedict slammed Satan out of two guys, and in 2000, Pope John Paul II attempted to exorcise a woman, but failed to do so. Father Amorth later witnessed the possessed woman crawling up the walls like a spider. Interesting. In Roman Catholicism, exorcism is a sacramental, but not a sacrament. Unlike baptism, confession, first communion. Unlike a sacrament, exorcism's integrity and efficiency do not depend on the rigid use of an unchanging formula or the ordered sequence of prescribed actions. Its efficiency depends on two elements, authorization from valid and illicit church authorities and the faith of the exorcist. Ever since the rise of the popularity of exorcisms in the movie of, you know, similar name, the church has tried hiding that they still practice them, but we know better. And in first place, we have some unethical history German stuff. Thanks to guidelines, I have a lovely dictionary of words I cannot say, so I'll try to give you all a little list right now. Yahtzee's gonna represent a group that carries about, you know, a very distinct flag, and evil dictator Schmiedler is their leader. But I'll just use evil dictator or cruel dictator. I hope y'all can follow along, cause things are about to get dicey. Remember that bank I just talked about? Yeah, time to get even more in depth. A filed lawsuit claims that during the dictator's reign, the Vatican Bank received at least 200 million Swiss francs from his puppet Utasha regime, money that his followers allegedly looted from groups of people they set out to um, eliminate. The class action suit, headed up by attorney Keelan Friesen at Minneapolis law firm Zimmerman Reed, involves 2,000 plaintiffs who are seeking an accounting of purported funds as well as restitution that can amount to around 200 million dollars. 
The claim also names, you know, unidentified Swiss, Austrian, Argentine, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and German banking institutions. Our plaintiff's lawyers say some of the plunder may have been routed to help the war criminals escape to Argentina. The suit relies on once classified documents from various countries that have been made public in recent years, as well as a 1998 U.S. government report issued by Commerce Undersecretary Stuart Eisenstadt. Some of the report's most damning evidence appears in a 1946 intelligence memo from a U.S. Treasury agent named Emerson Bigelow, who states that the Swiss francs were held in, you guessed it, the Vatican for safekeeping. The Vatican has constantly denied allegations of receiving Yahtzee gold and said in its internal review that they showed no trace of such funds. Sure, I'm totally gonna trust the internal review from a bank that destroyed their records for 70 years before going public. One of the reasons the Vatican has been criticized is that it refuses to open its archives as others have done. A key figure in helping the Utashi was Krunoslav Draganovic, a Croatian priest who was head of the College of San Girolamo in Rome. Men from Croatia who wanted to become priests lived at San Girolamo while studying for ordination. After World War II, the college served as a safe house for the Usashi underground. It is alleged that Draganovic had aided the military and civilian leaders who had been in power in Croatia and committed war crimes. His assistance consisted in obtaining false documents and safe passage out of Italy. People write that there are allegations that he used his Vatican bank connections to launder gold stolen by, you guessed it, and that he was paid for his cooperation. He admitted in a 1945 that he had personally moved 40 kilos of Utashi gold to Rome, concealed in two packing cases. A request made under the Freedom of Information Act resulted in the 1997 release of Bigelow's report. Criminal conduct described in the report led to the institution of a 1999 lawsuit against the Vatican Pink. Criminal conduct described in the report led to the institution of a 1999 lawsuit against the Vatican Bank filed by survivors and its descendants. The lawsuit was dismissed in 2009 under terms of the Sovereign Immunities Act. Although the legal case no longer stands, moral questions surrounding the plunder remain. Yeah, I've got a few questions of my own. Now, ever since allegations concerning the Vatican Bank and the Croatian plunder became public, requests have been made to the Vatican to allow access to archival documents from the time of Pope Pius. Pius was Pope from 1939 until 58, and if there's any anything, it would be found on documents from his papacy if they still exist. According to Gerald Posner in God's Bankers, following tradition, documents relevant to Pope Pius could have been made public on March 12th of 2014, 75 years after his election as Pope, but you guessed that the date passed without any release of those documents. At a 1997 conference on looted Yahtzee gold in London, the Vatican was the only one of 42 countries that rebuffed all requests for archival access. At a 1998 restitution summit in Washington, it ignored an emotional plea by U.S. Secretary of State and stood aside as 44 countries approved an ambitious plan to return, you know, icky looted art and property, settle unpaid life insurance claims, and reaffirm the call for open access to that time era archives. Subsequent pleas for opening the files by Bill Clinton, the State Department, and other organizations went unanswered. Enthusiasm over a 1999 Vatican announcement to allow Jewish historians into the wartime archives was short-lived. Access was limited to 5,000 documents that had been selected and published years earlier by four hand-picked academics. 